Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Okay, yes. All right. So it's my honor today to introduce our speaker for the lunchtime talk. Uh, this is Dr. David Clemmer. He comes here from uh, Indiana U University where he has the Robert and Majuri Mann Chair of Chemistry Position. <laughs> he is also here this weekend because he is a recipient of the 2010 Adams State Outstanding Alumnus Award. And so um, he graduated from Adams State College, 1987, with a degree in chemistry. Go chemistry. <laughs> um, and I must say that he has done a lot of impressive things with that chemistry degree. So after Adams State College, he went on to the University Sorry. of Utah where he got his PhD. Oh. in 1992. Yeah. Then he did a couple of postdocs after that. One at a place I can't pronounce. It's very good. <laughs> at the Institute of Technology in Japan and then also at Northwestern University. And since then he has been at Indiana University. He has done work in technology to characterize biomolecules and through that work he has had over 150 publications. 10 patents and more awards than I'm going to go through because it's a huge list, but I will go through a couple of them. He has been awarded the National Science Foundation Special Creativity Award and Early Career Award, HITCOM Achievement Award, Eli Lilly Analytical Chemistry Award, Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellow, and uh, 2009 Tracy M. Sonneborn Award from the University of Indiana in recognition of his exceptionally creative and impactful research. <clears throat> um, I thought this was pretty cool. He's also been uh, named as MIT, on the list anyway, of MIT's Technology Review as one of the top inventors of the next century. And in popular science, he was named one of the 10 most brilliant, uh, or on the 10 most brilliant list. Uh, so in his spare time, which I don't think he has much, he's also, um, it's all spare time. <laughs> <laughs> He's also founded two biotech companies, Beyond Genomics and Predictive Physiology and Medicine. And interestingly enough, he co-founded Beyond Genomics with another Adam State alum, Steve Valentine. So quite an impressive list. Two years ago, I had the opportunity of meeting David when we had a meeting at Indiana University. And I got to see his lab and some of the technology that he's been creating. And I must say, it's really cool. And I was also very impressed at how down to earth he is, even having this impressive list of awards and accomplishments. Um, so will you please help me in welcoming David Clumber back to Adams State College. <laughs> by giving a lecture. So I've asked Don Richmond to entertain us. <laughs> I don't know how we got him here, but um, I, I would give up any time to hear Don play. And so uh, would you start with the song? I think we've got a plan. Um, is this OK if I do this? I, I know we only have an hour. What's the next class in here? General biology. Can't they meet outside? It's a nice thing. <laughs> um, so what, what I'd like to do is uh, Don will start with a song. And then I'm going to try to remember how to play a song while he's playing, and then try to join him. And I don't play the guitar much, but he was my guitar teacher when I was young. And uh, then I'll give this lecture if there's time for it. <laughs> well, this is a new sort of gig that David and I are working on. You know, if we can get this chemistry lecture music thing together, you know, maybe we'll take it on the road. <laughs> I did it. This is a little song that is a pretty new one for me. It's uh, on a uh, new record that is just coming out. And uh, it was sort of prompted by a stargazing party and, you know, talking about measuring the masses of large things. And there's large things in this hey, song, like, you know, stars. And like one moment. Uh, you just couldn't have been more. Maybe you should, uh, I should lecture while you. <laughs> Keep going. 
going. I mean, this song has everything from electrons to stars in it. So, you know, I've, I've been wanting to write a song about the love affair of electron shells. You know, it's like, <laughs> but it's so cool how they fit together. You know, it's like this this atom has some missing in its other electron shell, and this one has some some, some it's barren and they hook together. Okay, wait a minute. I haven't that's quite later, got that one done. It's later in the lecture, but here's the first part. <laughs> okay, well, this, is, this is good. This is good. Okay, this is called burn. I want to burn like a film, like a white hot wire, like a star up in the film. I want to catch on fire. Explode with desire. I wanna burn like a film. I wanna catch you on fire. I wanna quiver like a crisp when the current hits, like some evanescent vessel full of emptiness. I wanna shoot like a ghost. Strung across a line. I wanna burn like a film. I wanna catch you on fire. in terrible positions. I don't know why I do it. You're sort of, oh, I'll sit over here. I'll try to face you. Do you have a pick? Do you have two picks? Did you just start that song? What's that? Did you just start that song? Okay. Who would give a lecture and in the middle of it play the guitar? What a crazy thing to do. Unless you wanted to show the node properties of a wave and then. Um, is that the speed?
I didn't know I'd be so nervous. Drunk out of my mind. Get it from the fact that you are here. And I have not been known as the saint of San Joaquin And I just assume right now Head on over to the side of the road Go oh, and show you And you're whispering in my ear And I had been around the gypsy girl and the garden of the devil I've it's funny Don't you think we should have one more song done? Um, are you going to Are you going to stick around for a minute? Yeah, I'm okay. Stick around. I might learn something. Well, I uh, you gave this wonderful introduction, and uh, we're we must be uh, in phase and coherent because we're I I t I'm going to talk about um, a mass scale that has to do with. Um, basically from Einstein's relationship of uh, energy and mass up to the mass of the universe. And the reality is I know very little about this mass scale, and you'll see the part that I know about in a little bit, but there's this thing called Wikipedia. <laughs> and uh, so I can look it up, and you can too if you want to. And so uh, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up masses, what you'll find is that um, 
There's a page and a half of definitions in any dictionary, and there's as much information as you want looking up masses and definitions in, um, on the Wikipedia page. And for this talk, what I mean is the, um, the amount of matter that an object possesses, and then measurements for the masses would be also for you and me. How do we measure things that are going to be valuable for masses of people? And um, my co-conspirators, and I do this this way every time I do anything. I invite a group of students in, and this is the group I invited in to say, you know, I'd like to give this lecture, and, but I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, could you help me think about this? And this is the group that helped me. Um, and this guy right here you'll recognize. This is Steve Valentine, Brian Bohr, Sun Young Lee, and uh, Elizabeth Siegel. And uh, they um, looked up a lot of the information and also just helped me think through what was relevant and what was not relevant. And we started off by thinking about um, all areas of chemistry, uh, and our second idea about a comprehensive mass spectrum was that it should include biology and medicine. And then before we knew it, uh, we arrived at um, basically trying to include everything. And that was probably a mistake to do, because there's not a mass scale that, that existed. And so we wound up uh, with a lot of freedom in that we could sort of invent this ourselves and look it up and put it on the scale. But also, maybe this is something that you shouldn't do. If it hasn't been done before, there's often a reason why it hasn't been done before. And this scale, um, for the scientific people in the audience, um, starts off with one kilogram here. And these are kilograms in um, 10 orders of magnitude. So K, this is uh, 10 billion uh, mass of kilogram increment increase. So this would be 10, kil 10 billion kilograms all the way out to 10 to the 70th kilograms. And we're going to go all the way down to 10 to the minus 40. And I don't know if we can turn off these lights or not. Is that possible? Yep. <coughs> because we've put together these really wonderful um, pictures of the universe that some of you might, you've probably seen them living here. You have a good view of the universe. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so um, now I have to find my computer. And so the first region out here on this 10 to the 70th range, we called the region of the unimaginable, because we tried to find something we understood that we could explain, and there was nothing. And so that region comes from a measurement that's made from the Hubble telescope. And if you were to hold your hand out uh, as far as you could hold it, about a meter, and hold your finger up so that about a millimeter uh, of uh, area shown through this uh, finger, uh, your hole in your hand, um, that's about the area of the sky we're looking at. So just a tiny fraction of the sky, and it's, it's positioned here so that the Hubble looks away from the light of the Earth, so you're not distracted by the stray light. And when you look at the universe at its very distant uh, edges, this is a, a shot of the universe that happened only about 400 to 800 million years after the universe was formed. The universe is about 13.73 <coughs> billion years old, and so this is looking back in time about 13 billion years, and this is what the universe looked like. And when you look up in the heavens, Don, you're looking back in time, a very long time. And uh, these are the galaxies that you see, and there are roughly 10,000 galaxies uh, in this. They have different shapes, as you can see. Some of them are spinning around. And this is the uh, expected mass of the universe. It's number 10 to the 52. And this number uh, looks like this. It's 10 with uh, 52 zeros, or 1 with 52 zeros after it. And um, if you were to calculate how we get this number, it comes about from simply a volume calculation, 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the cubed here is in light years, and we have a density of stars, and then we use the mass of our own star to plug in there to get the value for the mass of the universe. And the error in this measurement is phenomenal. If you were just to take a, a zero or two off, that's this spread in either direction, and that's how well we don't know the mass of the universe. And much of the mass of the universe comes from dark energy, which actually places the true mass um, three orders of magnitude uh, higher here. So it's a really interesting thing to begin to think about. Now, as chemists, we often reduce problems. And so this was uh, the first step in reducing it, was to look at the, the mass of a galaxy. And this is a typical galaxy. This one would look a lot like our own galaxy. And when we look out into the stars at Adam State, uh, at night, and I used to do this all the time as a kid. I just thought this was the greatest thing, is you can go and you can, you can get to a place on the planet where there's very little background light, and you can look up through uh, this uh, image almost, only you can't see it from this angle um, because uh, we sit about here. So you're, you're looking back through this way or this way through the, through the galaxy as you look at it. And that's the Milky Way that you see. And uh, 
The um, average mass of a galaxy then, uh, there are about 10 to the ninth or so galaxies in the universe, and so it weighs on the order of 10 to the 43 kilograms. Still pretty hard to imagine. Um, and so we, we go to the next part of this spectrum. We call this uh, the region, we should have called it barely imaginable. Um, it uh, stretches from about a billion kilograms out to 10 to the 40th kilograms. Here. And uh, this uh, region of the universe now is smaller than the size of a galaxy. And I think we can imagine the mass of our sun, at least I can after studying science for 25 years, begin to get a feeling for the mass. Mainly because I, I've learned something about how the Earth goes around the sun, and I know something about the mass of the Earth, which is about almost a million times uh, smaller than the mass of the sun. And so there's where our sun and our Earth would be. Here's where a black hole would be on the scale. And uh, you could put now, beginning to divide the Earth up and reducing this further, this is the total amount of water on the Earth. You can see that while the atmosphere is bigger, much bigger, than the total amount of, of water, it goes out for 60 miles or so, um, it's, there's much less of it. And so that's why it's much more fragile and it's easy to interact with it. There's even much less uh, of a natural resource such as coal. And people are beginning to calculate these things very carefully because they are going to impact um, human as well as uh, animal outcomes. So the next reason that we put into this scale was uh, what we called the comprehensible mass region. And uh, this, uh, I didn't say how far it stretches, you can see it from here. Um, this uh, stretches from around a microgram, 10 to the minus 6 grams, out to around the size of a great pyramid. And if you had thousands of workers meeting hundreds of years, day after day after day, you could move with your own hands uh, these uh, blocks and stack them up and make an object that weighed almost 10 billion kilograms, which is quite an object. And this would be the mass of a human. Um, this is no ordinary human. This is uh, Herman Wells, um, who was the president of Indiana University and helped rebuild the banking system uh, after the first uh, Great Depression. I thought first Great Depression might alarm someone. Um, <laughs> Herman uh, also uh, was a great proponent of academic freedom. And uh, the reason that Indiana University is a very special place is because of, of Herman's defense of academic freedom. And he was uh, president from a young age. I think he started at age 38, and he went uh, as a chancellor until he was well into his late 90s. And if you were to turn his mass into uh, what's your, uh, he's worth his weight in gold, he would be worth in today's gold market about $2.2 million. <laughs> so you can calculate then, um, or at least of interest to me, was how much uh, mass can we influence. And uh, the, the most a human can lift with their own uh, body is around uh, 450 kilograms, that's about here. But a human's kind of amazing. Um, we've done this experiment now uh, several times, and you can take a few grains of a material with your hands and toss it onto a balance many times and figure out that you can uh, lift only a few grains of something that puts you down into about the microgram region of being able to manipulate mass. So you can actually manipulate mass over a wide range, uh, more than eight orders of magnitude, based on this argument. And finally we get down, this is a very interesting region. Um, how many students do we have here? A handful of students? This region is an area where very little information, direct measurement of mass exists. And so as you go through your career, I think this is a huge area of opportunity. There are about 13 orders of magnitude in here that we can't measure very well. And I'll show you some of the ways that we're trying to measure those uh, areas. This is not one of our measurements. This is a, a very clever a device. This is a nanofabricated silicon diving board. And it's about 500 nanometers long. And this is, you have to put this, you could call it 0.6 microns, but uh, you can't get that funded because it's not nanochemistry, <laughs> okay? Um, you can get funded, though, if it's 500 nanometers. And here, you've got a single E. coli coming in and landing. And the idea here is we take a piezoelectric material and we vibrate this diving board, and it has a resonant frequency with the piezo material until the C. coli lands on it, and then the frequency changes, and from that frequency shift, you get a measurement of this mass. So I think they're dreaming with this technology a little bit, because I think that uh, where you land matters, and they've got lots of work to do, but it's an amazing first step down into this region where almost nothing else exists in terms of the measurements. They're all calculations, so it's nice to see some experimental data. Um, 
you know, if you noticed here, human cells are much more massive than bacteria, um, but we, we undernumber them. In your body, you carry around, uh, you have about a 10 to 100 trillion human cells in you, and that makes the 70 kilograms that we talked about. But in your body, um, you carry around roughly 2 to 10 times that number in bacteria, mostly in your gut, but also on your skin, inside your, um, any, any orifice of your body has a lot of bacteria in it. And uh, so you might uh, begin to think about um, the evolutionary role of bacteria with humans from thinking about that. Um, a virus is much smaller uh, than a bacteria. This would be a picture of a virus. And this is beginning to ask the question, is a virus living or is it a molecule? And um, in this virus, I don't know what, how much uh, you guys teach about viruses, and I know very little, but uh, my colleagues are interested in viruses, and they tell me that you pack the RNA in viruses with an extraordinary pressure as it's packed in here. And in fact, it's about 60 atmospheres of pressure that the RNA coils up with and goes into the virus. And when the virus attaches to the cell, it has a mechanism that opens up on the bottom and it's spring-loaded and it shoots that uh, RNA into the cell with uh, the spring-loaded uh, 60 atmospheres of pressure behind it. So there's very little information there. There's much more information down here in the quantum and mass uh, region. And I was walking around before my lecture right out here in the hall, and you have some beautiful descriptions on posters out in the hall if you want to take a look at this. This is the mass of a large protein, probably the most abundant protein in your body, certainly in your plasma. It's called human serum albumin. It's, a, it's thought to be a trash collector in your blood. And it weighs on the order of um, 66 kilodaltons, which falls right in here. You'll learn about a kilodalton in just a moment. But this protein, if you notice here, this 1 times 10 to the minus 22 kilodaltons, we've written underneath here C3076 N, or sorry, H4833 N821 and so on. And this is an important thing to write. Now we know with atomic detail exactly what the composition of this protein is. And we do this with a measurement that's based on electrospray ionization that I'll show you in just a moment. And this is about the largest thing that we can do this for. Um, this is another uh, set of molecules that's in this region here of the chemically important molecules. This is a Buckminster fullerene molecule. When I was in college, my teachers taught me that there were only two forms of carbon. Do you know what they are? Diamond and graphite, right? They were wrong. And you should never listen too carefully to these teachers because <laughs> they'll teach you all kinds of wrong things. And uh, there are actually a large number of different forms of carbon. And this is a beautiful carbon uh, fullerene. And that molecule is arguably the origin of uh, the nanosciences movement in the United States and around the world. We eventually made uh, nanotubes out of this. This, this is the molecule that uh, Rick Smalley uh, got the Nobel Prize for um, a few years ago. And uh, certainly he was one of my heroes. He's passed away recently. Um, and you have molecules like benzene and water on this chart. And eventually we get down to the size of a proton or a neutron. An electron is about 1,800 times smaller than a proton, Don, on this scale. It's very, very small. But you can now measure it. We can measure it in our laboratory. We can measure a mass with such precision that we can see a molecule with and without an electron. And if you wanted to really push this idea further, we're getting right down on the edge of where I wanted to push this idea you can begin to think about Einstein's equivalence of mass and energy. And you know the electronic states that they're teaching us about as having an energy above the ground state. In general chemistry, you might learn about something like this. If you were to calculate uh, one of the low-lying electronic states, I've called it one electron volt. One electron volt is equal to 23.06 kcals per mole. If you're a spectroscopy it's person, it's um, 8,065.54 wave numbers, if you think about that. But that's a low-lying electronic state. We're almost to the point where we can begin to think about measuring the energy of an excited electronic state by measuring the mass of the molecule and telling the difference in population of whether it's an excited state or a ground state from the mass. Can you tell I'm excited about that point? I think that's profound. Okay, now that's it then. We have it. And maybe I should stop there, but I, I didn't. I kept going. And, uh, and so let me say a few more things. Um, this is the region, you young people will have to make decisions, and this is an unfortunate thing about growing old. Um, and you'll have to pick one region of this mass scale to work on if you want to have any significant impact. 
And so when I came to school as a chemist, I picked this region. That's the region that's interesting for chemists. And uh, I picked it largely because I got so fascinated with quantum mechanics and the structure of an atom that I, I couldn't get away from it. And uh, this shows then the masses of this electron through the chemically important region. And eventually, in uh, the early 1900s, uh, late, I think 1897 is when J.J. Thompson got credit for sort of characterizing the properties of an electron in a discharge. And this is the guy who did that. He, he, we often say he discovered the electron as a negatively charged particle. His son later described this as a wave, and uh, each of them won Nobel Prizes for this idea. But in his discovery of the electron, J.J. Thompson also invented the first mass analyzer, mass spectrometer, in 1907. And he developed, uh, eventually this mass range was developed, and it destroyed <coughs> parts of this beautiful theory that John Dalton had written, which we teach in general chemistry, and still a powerful theory, but Thompson got to revise it. And so he named it the scale, or others named it, I'm not sure about the history here, the Dalton. And so we talk about these as being Daltons if they're neutrals. If we measure them as mass to charge, we call them Thompsons in honor of J.J. Thompson. And this would show one of his very early mass spectra. And these are the masses. What's happening here is we're putting these into a magnetic and electric field. And because they're charged particles, they will bend in these fields in response to the fields. And here you can see these parabolas are uh, neon 20 and neon 22. And that's a very significant uh, measurement. Uh, Thompson actually ascribed neon 20 and neon 22 peaks to neon 20 and neon dihydride peaks, but he got it wrong. And what he missed was that every atom, uh, or many atoms, have what's called a stable isotope. We knew about the radioactive isotopes, but we didn't know that stable atoms had stable isotopes. And that was not in John Dalton's theory. You can see that uh, they didn't know about uh, mercury poisoning yet, and they were still using mercury pumps to pump down their instrument. Those are these mercury lines. The negatively charged ions are over here, the positively charged ions are over here. And what makes this spectrum possible is this effect called resolving power. And resolving power, if I've left you and you're asleep on me, wake up for just a second, because we're going to use this definition for the next couple of slides. It's defined as m over delta m, where delta m is the width of this peak and m is the center of the peak. Now, if I want to make my resolving power high, there's two ways to do it. I want the students to tell me how to do it from that equation. Everybody, I can either increase m or decrease delta m. That's right. So we're going to work on the decreasing of delta m, and that will improve our resolving power. We're going to try to make these peaks as sharp as we can, and that will improve the accuracy as well as the precision of what we can measure, and eventually we'll be able to measure things that become chemically relevant. And J.J. Uh, Thompson had a student named uh, Aston, and Aston was able to build an instrument that basically scanned out the masses onto these photographic plates. And here I'm going to come to, these are different elements, nickel, chlorine, argon, krypton, and xenon. They all have different masses. I'm going to focus you in on just the chlorine isotopic ratios. You might have learned this already, that chlorine 35 to chlorine 37, that isotopic ratio is 3 to 1. That's a very powerful thing that many of the elements have. And if you know that that isotope's there, and you measure a mass spectrum of something like this, this is um, uh, um, chlorobenzene molecule, and it's got one chlorine in it, and we know that because it has a peak in it here that has this peak that's three times larger than this peak over here, so it's three to one. And that tells us that it's chlorobenzene. When we put energy into this, we can break this bond and make uh, this molecule, and that molecule shifts in mass by either 35 units or 37, depending on which isotope it lost, and there's only a single peak there. And so that sort of information can be compiled uh, and used to interpret the mass spectrum or used to interpret the molecular structure of many small molecules, small organic molecules especially. And I think uh, many people contributed to the development of that field, but one of the people who contributed the most to interpretation of molecular structure was a guy named Fred McClafferty from Cornell. And I was really hoping that Fred would win the Nobel Prize yesterday, so I would just look like a visionary when I came here and described this to you. Many people think that he should win the Nobel Prize. Um, but, but he was passed over, um, maybe next year. This guy did win the Nobel Prize, and his name is John Fenn. These are three of my PhD students meeting with him right after he, a couple of years after he had won the Nobel Prize. And what Fenn did was he extended the mass range that we could see by developing a technique called electrospray ionization. 
And in electrospray ionization, we put our, say, a protein molecule, this is a huge molecule to ionize, in a solution back here, and we make it as an electrified droplet. And then this droplet dries and is transmitted into the instrument and gives you a spectrum. And you guys are all familiar with this process of making electrified droplets <laughs> because you've all had this happen. And uh, you can see the droplets here. And what you can see in this slide is, um, is this protein uh, ubiquitin in this case. It's got exactly this chemical formula, 378 carbons and so on, with different numbers of protons attached to the surface of the protein. And so the mass to charge ratio goes down as the number of protons increases, okay? Now I want you to just take a look at that spectrum. We'll come back to this in a minute. And I realize this is getting pretty technical. Jan, how are you doing? <laughs> are you following along? Is she awake? Okay. Okay. This guy has really pushed mass uh, resolution. His name is Alan Marshall from Florida State University. A number of people have. I picked a few to highlight. And this is a hard slide to explain uh, because it's normalized with respect to the molecular weight of ubiquitin. But this is that same ubiquitin spectra. And here we're plotting the space between the peaks relative to how well we can resolve the peaks. And the idea here is that as the resolution of your instrument goes up, you become uh, good enough to resolve that charge state distribution that I showed you for ubiquitin. And if you increase the resolution a little more, you see that underneath this peak, the single peak right here is not just that charge state distribution, but rather the nine protonation state plus um, one proton being replaced by a single sodium atom. And you guys know that sodium likes to ionize very easily, has a low ionization energy. And if you took this single peak right here and you increase the resolving power anymore, you can actually get to the point where you can resolve the number of carbon 13s in this molecule. So this is all carbon 12. Here's one carbon 13, two carbon 13s. In, intercalated into the whole sequence of carbons. That's the naturally occurring isotope of carbon that we just talked about a moment ago. If you took one of these and blew it up even more, you realize that there are two carbon 13s will equal uh, one sulfur. And so in this molecule, one sulfur has substituted for two of these carbon 13s, and we've got enough mass resolution to tell them apart because of the, the binding energy of sulfur versus carbon in mass. Now, what you can't do yet is detect these electronic states. And what you can't do yet is detect the energy difference of a molecule that's been reconfigured as a different isomer. And that's a hard concept to understand as a general audience. But if you put the atoms together in a different structure, you make a different isomer, and those have different fundamental energies. And we would like to be able to detect an isomer based on its mass and its energy shift. And so that's one of the things we've been working on. While you can't do it directly with mass spectrometry, my postdoctoral mentor, Martin Gerald, and his postdoctoral mentor, Mike Bowers, who I didn't show a picture of here, um, were beginning to use drift tubes in the late, in the late 1980s, uh, in the case of Gerald especially, uh, to separate these clusters of molecules. And here is um, a, a sphere coming through. These are different shapes. They're both silicon, 29 atoms of silicon. And he saw the separation of these two different shapes with a gas in here. And so the idea was, that these molecules had different, um, different drift times depending on their, um, their size. Can someone turn on these lights for me for just a second? I'm going to have to, or maybe I can do it. Okay. Okay. So these two pieces of paper have the same nominal mass to charge ratio. But if I take one of them and I change its isomeric structure and make it a different isomer, they have different drift times through the gas. In this case, the gas is is air, and the field is gravity, but you could do this with an electric field, and it always works like this. The big one always takes longer than the small one. And Gerald and Bowers' group developed this as a spectroscopic probe about the time I was looking for a postdoc. And you can see that someone interested in the things I was interested in just thought this was the greatest thing, and I sent Martin Gerald an email, and he hired me, actually it wasn't an email, this is sort of pre-email, I sent him a real letter which you guys would never do. And he wrote me back um, the paper that he was writing um, that basically was the idea that I was proposing. And uh, he, would, he had already thought of it and was well on his way. And it was basically this paper. And uh, he's uh, been a longtime collaborator of mine. And he's able to resolve this portion of this scale. And Mike Bowers is able to separate electronic states of something like titanium because they have different sizes. And so he's able to resolve this portion of the scale. Okay. 
And so that's where things were when I started as an assistant professor. And I thought, well, if you could do this on large mixtures of molecules, you would dramatically improve um, the ability to resolve peaks with mass spectrometers. And here is, um, I'm going to shift gears now. Even a very simple system in biology, if I just took a milliliter of your blood out of your body and I spun out all the cells, so all I'm left with is the fluid part of your blood, you would have in the plasma part of your blood probably close to 50,000 to 100,000 different proteins. And those proteins are in contact with, um, that, that, those proteins come from all of your cells in your body. And they're in contact with your plasma through the interstitial fluid in your body. And so they're reporters of everything that goes on inside your body. Okay? If you get a tumor someplace in your body, the earliest reporter that you could get would be a molecular signature of those cells that are misbehaving, sloughing off, being caught up into the plasma and working their way down and being able to detect then um, these, this molecular signature of that tumor. And that's the holy grail of what it is that we try to like to do for the masses with these technologies. And what you can see here is that this very simple mixture, there are only 14 proteins here, is so complicated that even though we have plenty of resolution in our mass analyzer to detect this, um, the peaks are falling on top of each other, they're overlapping just like the rocks do to make a mountain in the San Luis Valley in between. And uh, you can see then that you can't resolve some things. And so our idea was to couple a drift tube to a mass spectrometer in a way that made it very efficient. And I won't go through the details of this, but the, the basic idea is that we could slow the ions down for milliseconds by separating them through helium instead of air and then fire them into this time of flight that's in a vacuum and separate them in microseconds and by doing that, we would have a two-dimensional report of the molecule. And at the time we did that, it was a hard thing to do. We called that a nested measurement. People had made similar combinations to this uh, in the 1960s and early 1970s, but they didn't have the electronics to make a nested measurement. And the nested measurement allowed you to measure all ions at the same time. And this, um, this basically shows a picture of what this sort of an instrument would look like. Um, we're not showing a rack of electronics back in this side of the lab or the one that we're standing in front of here to run this instrument. So it has thousands of parts to it. We designed and built all of these parts. Here's our electrospray ionization source. We run the ions down this tube filled with helium. And then you can't see it because Stormy's standing right in front of it. But right back here is uh, a time of flight mass analyzer that we put on the back. And this very talented um, graduate student built this machine while living in Indianapolis and commuting both directions in four years <coughs> and did her PhD. Um, and this is what it will do for you. That same digest with that same large chemical background, now we plot the mass spectrum on this axis and the drift time on this axis. And this uh, now is almost 10 years old, I think. But you can see the excitement that we had by seeing these individual peaks. Each one of these individual peaks is a different peptide that's now been resolved, and it was well underneath the chemical background that we could detect before. And I'll show you just a couple of more examples of this. So what we could do then, this is the same data set, if we integrated our data along a narrow portion of the data, for example here, we could begin to fish out low abundance components that couldn't be seen in this complicated mixture. And really, some of the components can't be seen with any other way. They have exactly the same mass to charge, but you can fish them out based on their structures. And um, this is just one more example of this. This is a very hard problem. This is polyethylene glycol. And um, this is a hard problem because when you electrospray polyethylene glycol, it's a polymer, and it doesn't come as one size. It's polyethylene glycol with 40 ethylene glycol units and 41 and 42 and 43 and so on. And then when you electrospray it, you get the overlaying charge state distribution of one proton or two protons or three protons, and they overlap in this spectrum. I'll show you that here in a minute. And so here we have um, polyethylene glycol. That's the big baseline that I'm talking about that cannot be resolved. And then this is our two-dimensional structure where I'm going to argue that we can resolve it. And here, here we can't resolve it in the mass analysis region. If we blow up just this region, which corresponds to it, you can see that we get this fantastic uh, set of peaks. It almost looks like a scattering pattern, doesn't it? Um, and what you can see underneath here is these peaks that you probably didn't even notice are tiny, but they're there, and they show you um, the mass spectrum of polyethylene glycol with just two charges and 28, 29, or 30 uh, glycol units on it. And here's the plus 3 charge state. And you can do this for any peak in your spectrum. Here's the plus 10 ions. And if, if you were a mass spectrometrist, this became a very important 
uh, idea, and this sort of a data set um, was, uh, was needed in order to convince people that this uh, technology had, had a lot of merit. And so the basic idea of these combinations of technologies is it combines information about the shape and the mass of the molecules. You can do this in milliseconds. It couples with other separations techniques like liquid chromatography or gas chromatography. You can increase your peak capacities. Um, we've got um, peak capacities that we've increased by more than a factor of 1,000. So we now have an instrument that will measure, at least in its theory, it will measure uh, more than 100,000 molecules at a time in a single snapshot. And so that becomes a very powerful thing to have. And um, it's now recently been developed. Uh, one of the partners of Beyond Genomics licensed this uh, from Beyond Genomics, and it's sold as the Synapt. It's only been available commercially for a couple of years, but it's already sold um, a few hundred um, copies. The reason why it's only sold a few hundred copies is because it costs a lot of money. It's around $600,000. But people will pay it, and you can now get this sort of measurement made pretty much any place in the world that you'd like to get it made. And I've already told you about this application to the masses of human proteins. And I've already given you this uh, idea. Um, I feel like I may be running a little low on time. But you can see that we'd like to um, measure the proteins in plasma because uh, we think that you might be able to get markers uh, for disease state, which I've told you about a minute ago. And here's a really important uh, concept of your plasma. Your plasma has what are called uh, class, this is albumin, by the way, which I told you was the most abundant protein in your plasma. So it dwarfs everything. This is a logarithmic scale. And this uh, has, uh, there are roughly 11 or 12 uh, decades of differences in concentration of the molecules in your plasma. And there's no analytical technique that can detect that sort of range of concentrations. And so to be able to develop a technology that could have, uh, able to detect a few copies uh, in the presence of a large swamping background would be a huge advance. And I tell that to the students because I don't see how to solve that problem yet. I have some ideas, but it's a brute force method that I have. Um, the classical plasma proteins dip down into the mg's per mil or uh, micrograms per mil sort of concentration range. Um, you have then the, the, maybe the most interesting region is what's leaking out of your various tissues in your body. And these different proteins uh, span another four orders of magnitude difference in concentration. And you can see they vary wildly. This is sort of the uh, representation of the average and the variance of the system. And then things that are involved in immune response, for example, the interleukins are down here. And just, uh, uh, just, a sp just have a, a few copies of these at any time. And then your immune system turns on in response to something, and you'd like to be able to control that. And so that's the sort of thing that we think will be available for the masses in the future. And I wanted to mention um, one last uh, person in here. Graham Cooks has coupled um, electrospray ionization in a way where he doesn't even need to put the molecule in the solution anymore. You can just put the molecule on the surface and spray the surface with charged droplets. The droplets will absorb on the surface and, and you'll reach um, the Rayleigh limit. And some of the molecules will be absor absorbed into the droplet and dissolve in the droplet. They'll diffuse to the surface and at the Rayleigh limit they'll um, come off as ions into the mass spectrometer. And so he can now scan surfaces and measure their masses. He can, for example, put a person taking a drug up to an instrument and uh, spray their finger and watch how long it takes the drug to show up off their finger, which is kind of an astonishing thing. And he was featured, not he, but um, the technology was featured on uh, CSI about a year ago now, and it's become just a tremendously <coughs> popular thing. He's at uh, Purdue University, just up the road from us. This is a picture of my research group who uh, have uh, done uh, most of the work. It's about a year old. We have a new uh, picture that uh, I didn't have time to upload. It just came to me this morning. We've been very lucky and uh, have worked very hard to have funding from uh, various funding agencies and uh, have tried to push uh, the field forward. Certainly without the funding and the students, we wouldn't have made much progress. These guys are uh, one of the beauties of being at Indiana University is we have eight full-time machinists that take care of us to make machines. And we've kept large portions of this group busy for um, many months. Um, I have to thank uh, this guy. Um, this is me um, when I was uh, 21 years old, I think. 20, 22, maybe. Oh, I was 21. I was a junior. And uh, this is Kay Watkins. And Kay uh, Watkins, some of you haven't met him. Renee hasn't met Kay. Well, this is what he looks like. He still looks like this. <laughs> Very handsome guy. and. Uh, he, uh, he came up to me one day in the hallway, and he said to me, Dave, um, you've never been the top student in any of your classes yet. 
Um, and so we've never given you a award, right? A an award, right? And, 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 I, and I thought, uh, yeah, that's right. I, I've never gotten an award. And he said, well, we should give you some award. <laughs> and um, so I wasn't taking analytical chemistry anymore, but he gave me this award um, that was the analytical chemistry award. And I think I was, we had a problem in my class. We had this guy named Sam Hendricks, who was just brilliant and always blew the curve for everybody. And uh, he was always the top student. And so uh, I never got any awards. Uh, but uh, Kay gave me this award uh, in analytical chemistry. And the, the, the reason that this is important is I put it on my resume. And when I went for a job interview at Indiana University, they were looking for an analytical chemistry uh, person. And that department is very good in analytical chemistry. It's usually ranked number two or number three in the nation um, as an analytical chemistry group. And so if you want to do analytical chemistry, you want to come to Indiana or Purdue or North Carolina or Illinois. That the Midwest is really famous for analytical chemistry. And um, so when they were interviewing me, it was clear that we had a lot of overlap research-wise, but they weren't sure that I was really interested in analytical chemistry. And the top guy there looked down on my resume and he said, I've been nervous about this, but I see you've won this award in analytical <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> and so we're going to make you a job offer. And to that point, I was a physical chemist. Now I'm, I'm pretty much converted. I do um, a lot of both. And I, I can't thank you enough. Don Richmond, um, one more last thing you've done for me. I just can't, uh, I don't know how to describe, I want to say one last thing, um, as long as I've got the stage. Don um, may not remember this, but I was the little kid in the music store that um, my dad got me a job working at Music Arts Unlimited when I was, uh, before I turned 13 years old, actually. And then I turned 13 years old and I washed windows there. And then I was got given the, the job of tuning guitars there. And then one day I sold guitar, a guitar while I was tuning it, and then I was allowed to come onto the sales force. And then I was in the music store a lot of the time. And I don't know if you knew that was me or not, but I was the little kid behind the counter that sold you guitar strings when you came <laughs> in. And I always um, was so um, impressed with Don. Uh, there were two bands that I just loved at that time, Aspen Gold and Tumbleweed. And uh, I did a set of miniature bronze sculptures of you guys as a... Uh, I mean, they're only this tall. <laughs> but we cast, we cast them in my dad's uh, spinning uh, thing. And uh, I did that as a little kid. And, and Don wasn't famous yet. He was just an ordinary guy then. And, uh, but you could sort of see that he had this very special gift. And, that, um, and he was making a living playing music. And it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing to do, I think, at that time. But um, then as I got older, he took me under his wing. I begged him. And, and he gave me guitar lessons. And at that time, he wasn't teaching anybody. And so um, he said, well, you know, maybe I should teach you. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't make better use of, of what you <laughs> taught me. Um, but, um, that's, uh, and then I really uh, do appreciate everyone letting me come here and um, taking such good care of me and spoiling me. And thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if we have time, if what happens next. Are we going? Are we leaving? Okay. Adams State College. Great stories begin here.